Good evening. I'm Mark Patterson, the pastor at Brant Naz, the Brantford Church of the Nazarene, and it's good to have you to join us again this evening. We're here in Brantford, Ontario. Welcome to our In the Word study time. We have been going through a series of studies recently that I've called Encounters with Jesus, where I've been looking at uh, people who have encountered Jesus and the impact it has had on their life. And this week we are going to look at an encounter with Jesus of, of a man who had leprosy and how that unfolded. We find this account in the New Testament book of Matthew, sorry, the New Testament book of Mark, Mark chapter 1. And when I begin reading in a few minutes, I'm going to begin reading from verse 40. So that's Mark chapter 1, verse 40. Today we use the term leprosy for, for what is uh, generally known as Hansen's disease. But back in the biblical days, leprosy was used for as a general description of any infectious disease of the skin, uh, whether it's rashing or whatever it was that was infectious. It was, it was used to describe a wide variety of those diseases. It wasn't just limited to the, the, the uh, leprosy that we know today, the Hansen's disease. In our account today that whatever uh, variety of skin disorder this man had, we can see that it caused him a lot of suffering. The suffering was not only physical for this man, but it was also a social suffering that he suffered, that he had. Uh, the law required that the person with an infectious disease needed to uh, wear torn clothes, kept their, uh, have their hair unkept, uh, cover the, their lower body, uh, lower part of their face, and to cry out, unclean, unclean, so that people would stay away from them. They were required to live outside of the camp or the, the town that they were at. And as long as they had the infection, they remained of what was called unclean. Well, I'm going to read that account now in Mark chapter 1, starting at verse 40, and then we'll look at it a little closer. So listen as I read for us from Mark chapter 1. A man with leprosy came to him and begged him to, on his knees. If you are willing, you, you can make me clean. Jesus was indignant. He reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said. Be clean. Immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. Jesus sent him away at once with a strong warning. See that you don't tell this to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Instead, he went out and began to talk freely, spreading the news. As a result, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but, but stayed outside in lonely places. Yet the people still came to him from everywhere. Join your hearts with mine in prayer, if you would. Father, we thank you for your word, and we ask that you would speak to, this, to us to, today through your word and uh, show us how, how you want to uh, touch our lives and change our lives through it. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. For those just joining us, we're uh, in Mark chapter 1, the last, the end of the chapter from verses 40 to 45, looking at an account of Jesus healing a man with leprosy. As this scene opens, we see that instead of keeping his distance from Jesus, this man with leprosy, he actually went to Jesus and he came on his knees to Jesus and begged Jesus to, to, to heal him. Uh, you don't have to to enter a response right here, right now, but just uh, contemplate for yourself just a brief second here as you're looking at it. There in the very first verse, did, or, or the second verse, no, the first verse, or verse 40, uh, just think to yourself, did Jesus, sorry, did the leper believe that Jesus could heal him? Did the leper believe that Jesus could heal him? As we see there in verse 40, it does seem that the leper did have that belief. He said, you can heal me. Depends on the tone he uses, you can heal me or you can heal me. He's, he, he's making a statement that he believes he can heal him. The leper, the leper had likely observed Jesus uh, doing other healings or heard about Jesus doing other healings. So when Jesus came near him or close enough to him that he could get to him, he said to him that you can heal me. But here's a bit of a different question. Yes, the man believed that Jesus could heal him, but did the man with leprosy believe that Jesus would heal him? You don't need to answer the answer that, there. I'll just go, go to it. But did the man believe that Jesus would heal him? And it seems that that's where we have some doubt there uh, for, for that. It seems that the leper knew of Jesus' healing power. 
but yet he had some doubt of whether Jesus would heal him. When he says to them, if you are willing, not if you are able, he already felt, felt he was able to, but if you are willing to, to do that. The leper recognized the power of God that was in Jesus, but somehow he had questions about, possible doubts about Jesus' willingness to heal him. The leper was uncertain about Jesus' mercy, uncertain about Jesus' love toward him. And for the leper, that might not, not have been surprising because he had been a person who had been experiencing rejection, rejection anyway. He experienced the rejection of all the culture around him and all the people around him. So he could have possibly thought, well, why wouldn't G Jesus reject me too? I think sometimes we can fall into that trap. There could be things that we encounter and things that we can go through and we, we know that God can intervene, but we don't necessarily, maybe if I put the word on a doubt, but we're not necessarily believing that he will intervene. We know he can intervene, He know, but we don't necessarily know he will intervene or feel that he will intervene. And there can be all sorts of experiences that we go through in life that can skew our perspective that way. And it's good to recognize that with it. But we need to, we need to recognize that not only Jesus can do that, but Jesus will do that. Now, I'm not pr pr proposing with a, a name it, claim it, blab it, grab it sort of thing where if anything we name in Jesus' name, we can just claim it and take it. I'm not, I'm not promoting that at all. But sometimes the, the line between what we believe Jesus can do and what we believe Jesus will do can, can, can be a widening gap. And obviously it was for this man. Like, I know you can heal me, but will you? Are you willing? Are you willing to hear me? Now, the account that says that Jesus was indignant, Jesus was indignant in verse 41. That can present a problem to us because typically when we see the word indignant, we can see where it means either ignore, annoyed or angry. And we can ask ourselves, why would Jesus be annoyed or angry in this situation that we have here? But Jesus' actions seem to indicate otherwise when he is that he isn't annoyed or angry. So, so let me try and explain some of that about this word indignant. If uh, up until 2000, the 2011 uh, edition of the New International Version Bible, almost all versions of the Bible, including the New International Version of the Bible either use the phrase that Jesus was moved to pity or Jesus was moved to compassion. But then in 2011, the translators of the NIV, they put this word indignant in there. So does it mean a negative thing and, and like anger or or uh, as, as Jesus had it there, that Jesus was anger, angered there or was he mad there? Uh, there's two ways to look at it. First of all, I'm going to look at it that way about was Jesus angry? <clears throat> well, one thing we have to realize is that when we're to, when we're translating a language, we don't always have a language a word in the new language that matches it exactly. And the other thing is that we when we translate it into a, when we're translating again, when we do translate it, especially in, in an older language like like uh, from two thousand years ago, the Greek from two thousand years ago. What's the meaning of that today, in today's context that we look at that? So it can be, give us difficulty to do that. So from two perspectives here, we can see where uh, Jesus, one that Jesus responded ang angrily, and one that Jesus responded with compassion. First, if Jesus responded angrily, some of the scholars suggest that what Jesus was angry at was not this man, was not the disease itself, but was what is perceived to be the, the source of the disease. Satan himself, the devil himself. Jesus' anger was focused on, uh, on either on the man or the disease, but on Satan's work in this. Now, I have, personally, I have some challenges with that. It, part of it is the context of what we see here uh, and how Jesus did respond. But I, the other part I have with that is, that does that mean that if we hold that perspective, does that mean that all disease, all uh, sickness that we have comes from the devil? And I, 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 I would hesitate to say that. The, 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 some may do, but not all of it. We do live in a fallen world. And say things uh, can happen, things happen in a fallen world that, that don't, aren't indicative of the Satan causing it all. But if Jesus' response here is, is one that uh, is not one of anger, but is one of compassion and mercy which I, I think his actions which follow here seem to be indicative of, for Jesus to be 
indignant or to be for him to be indignant as it uses the word here in that context that can mean a couple of different things to us so for Jesus to be indignant in a compassionate way one could have this Jesus could be indignant because when this man says 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 to him if you are willing Jesus could be in a sense hurt by saying what do you mean if I'm willing haven't you heard about me what would ever make you think that about me that I wouldn't be willing in other words he somewhat hurt himself. Jesus somewhat hurt himself because it seems that this man is questioning him, not, not questioning him as far as um, Jesus' moral integrity or anything like that, but questioning him about who are you really, Jesus? Uh, I, I, Jesus would, came to, to, to uh, heal and to forgive. And why wouldn't this man think he would be willing to? That's one aspect of it. But Jesus could have also felt indignant. He could have felt... Uh, be, in a, from a compassionate and mercy side perspective, because he he sensed that the man's possess, sorry, the man's perception of his own self worth was so low, that Jesus was indignant at the man's perception of his own self worth. He thought to himself that not the man thought to himself that he he wasn't worthy. So the, maybe the man is asking him from the perspective, if you are willing, I'm I'm not really worth it. I'm not really worthy. I'm not really. Uh, one that I should expect you to do something for me. So if you're willing, and that could have hurt Jesus, not hurt Jesus from the sense of being angry, but hurt Jesus for the sake of the man himself. With this man having leprosy, I would imagine it could be somewhat similar to walking into a grocery store today, today or uh, or Canadian Tire or uh, any other place that we, we could go to in today's places, um, a restaurant today. And hanging a sign around our neck saying, I have COVID-19 in big capital letters. And saying, I have COVID-19 and shouting it out like the, the, the lepers back then would have to shout it out. Unclean, how clean? Unclean, unclean. How, how would they be received back then? How would we be received now in that situation? Eventually it's going to get to our self-esteem. It's going to affect our psyche. And how we're feeling about that. People would avoid avoid us. Uh, people would flee from us. They'd spread like, as I call it, they'd spread like cockroaches going under the crevices of the baseboard in a darkened room when the light is turned on. They'd get away from us as quick as they could. They'd try to avoid us. And this is what this man was living through. And so when he's going through all of this, eventually it would wear down on his psyche. So maybe Jesus is moved in, into compassion and pity for this man because he sees him as a man who has absolutely no self-esteem, a man who, who is perceived to be a pariah to society, a man who feels totally rejected, is who this man probably is. So maybe Jesus feels that way. But I turn it to us and I say, what about us? Do we have faith enough to believe that God can intervene in whatever the situation it is we're going through life, that God can intervene? Do we have faith enough to believe that God will intervene? Through whatever situation we're going through and if not why not and what would it take to instill that sort of faith in us what would it take to instill that sort of faith in our lives as well do we see ourselves as worthy enough for jesus to pour his love his mercy his compassion into us and on us i'm not talking here about being good enough for jesus because none of us is good enough for jesus on our own on our own standing we're not good enough for jesus I'm talking about being worthy. I'm talking about being worthy. Do we feel worthy of God, of Jesus' mercy and Jesus' compassion to be poured on us? Psalm, 19, Psalm 139 verse 14 tells us, I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. God has fearfully and wonderfully made us. God has made us. Are we not worthy of him then? Romans 6, 23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. In Christ Jesus, our, our Lord, the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Are we not worthy of his love and compassion if he gives us the free gift? Is Jesus Christ? Romans 5, 8. But God proves his love for us in that while we were still sinners, well, that while we were still, still were sinners, Christ died for us. That should show us that we are worthy we are worthy. We are worthy of his love. We are worthy of his compassion because while we were still sinners, Christ died for us and we're worthy. We can come to him. 
We are worthy for his love. We are worthy for his compassion. It's not can he do it, but we can believe he will do it too. We need to look to him with hearts of expectation. Well, as we move on in the account here in, in verse 41 there, it says that Jesus reached out and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. And immediately the man, the, the disease had left the man. Well, next, Jesus told this man something that might seem strange to us. What did you demand? What did Jesus tell the man next? You, if you could respond in the comment section there. What did Jesus tell this man next? After he healed him, what did he say to the man with a strong warning? <clears throat> what has Jesus said to this man in a strong warning as it states it there? Someone wants to put that through for a comment on it. What did Jesus tell this man? Maybe you're using your device and you not be able to watch the video at the same time. So what we see here where he told this man don't tell anyone. He says there with a stern warning, see that you don't tell this to anyone. Yeah, don't tell anyone. That's right, Joan. Don't tell anyone. Seems like a strange thing. This great thing has happened. And he says, make sure you don't tell anyone. Well, why might Jesus have told that, the man that? Well, I would suggest that it's because the more popular Jesus became, the more hindered his work would be. Because people would start to seek Jesus out as a great miracle worker, not for his main ministry of revealing who he was as the as Messiah and to bring uh, people to God, that he was the coming Messiah, that all people would see, see in him is uh, the great miracle worker and, and desired him to be the miracle worker. Jesus told the man to present himself and offer sacrifices that Moses had commanded for cleansing. There could be two two reasons for this. One is we, we've given here, as it said there, it's a testimony to them. It's a testimony to them in two ways. One is letting everybody know he's clean. And if he goes for these, to, to present the offerings that he's commanded, sacrifices, offer the sacrifices that Moses had commanded, the people are going to declare him clean. They're not just going to declare him clean because Jesus said so, but they're going to declare him clean because he had gone through the rituals. But also as a testimony to the priest and the others that yes, Jesus has done this. He's genuinely clean. This miracle has truly taken place. But here, if you can respond again, what did the man do instead? Instead of not telling anyone, what did the man do instead? We'll get that come through in a second. So what the man did instead was he did what was very human and very nature to him. I, I like how it says it there. Instead, he went out and began to talk freely, spreading the news. He just couldn't control himself. He had to tell people about it. And when we see where that happens, when the prohibition against what had happened made, it, made him all the more anxious to com complain. It's kind of like if you're a little kid and someone says, don't touch that, you want to touch that. Don't do that, you want to do that. When this man is told, don't tell anyone, he just is bursting at the seams. He can't wait to tell people. And why not? After all that he's been through, all the rejection he's been through, why not in one way? But this resulted in a curtailment of Jesus' ministry when it says there, as a result, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but had to stay outside in lonely places. Jesus' mission was to come and declare himself and show himself and reveal himself as the Messiah. It wasn't just to solely do miracles. Doing the miracles like this was a part of revealing himself, but that's not all he was known for. And so it hindered his ministry. He avoided going into the towns. He stayed in more isolated places. But even so, as it says there, the people still found him. And so as we bring it to a close and, and thinking with that, we uh, to a close on what happened here, we need to remember too that nonetheless, we must be obedient to what God tells us. No matter how it seems, this, Jesus had told this man, don't go tell anyone. 
But this man would say, why would I be quiet about this? The great thing you've done, I need to go tell. And we need to remember that when God tells us something, when we sense something from the Lord, we need to be obedient to it. Obedient to it no matter how contrary to what it may seem to even in our inner being. It doesn't seem normal that you wouldn't go and announce this, that you wouldn't go and celebrate this. But he says, don't do that. And he had a reason not to do that. Even if we feel we have a better way of doing things, we need to be willing to listen to the Lord. So let us be reminded of the man with leprosy. Let us be reminded that we each are worthy of the love, of the mercy, of the grace that Jesus has for us. Let us be reminded as the story unfolded that we need to be obedient to whatever the Lord would have us do and obedient to his will and in his way, not ours. Let me close this in prayer. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for uh, bringing us this encounter again tonight of looking at this man with leprosy and uh, just looking at it from different aspects and, and different uh, uh, perspectives of this man's life. And Father, help us to apply that to our lives so that we could share better who you are, so that we would know better who you are, and so that we would be obedient to you in all things. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. God bless you. And as always, you're more than welcome to join us on Sunday morning here at uh, 347 Fairview Drive in Brantford, Ontario. The Brantford Church of the Nazarene, Brant Naz. At 1030 for our in-person worship service with social distancing. And, or if you prefer, right here on Facebook Live, uh, Brant Naz Facebook page on Facebook Live. We'll live stream the service. If not, we'll see you next Sunday as well. Take care. God bless.